to the History Slam podcast from ActiveHistory.ca. Here's your host, Sean Graham. Thank you, Adam. Welcome to the History Slam, everybody. I am Sean Graham coming at you today nearly live from Ottawa, Ontario, where six days from today, a new program is debuting on the History Channel all about the rather substantial art collection that was put together by Adolf Hitler and the Nazis in an effort to create the greatest art collection the world has ever known and the effort since the Second World War to put that art back in its rightful place and with its rightful owners. The program is entitled Hunting Nazi Treasure, premiering Tuesday, October the 24th at 10 East and Pacific on the History Channel here in Canada. In tonight's episode, I had a chance to talk to two of the central figures involved in this program. The first was Robert M. Edsel. He you might be familiar with. He is the author of The Monuments Men, Allied Heroes, Nazi Thieves, and the Greatest Treasure Hunt in History, which was released in 2009. And of course, it became a movie in 2014, directed by George Clooney. He's also the founder of the Monuments Men Foundation for the Preservation of Art, an organization that strives to put these art pieces back with their original owners. We talk a little bit about the organization's work and how he goes about and how his organization goes about putting all of this together and then how they went about putting this into a television program. And from there, we were lucky enough to be joined by Steve Gamester, the series producer of the show, where we talk about some of the logistical difficulties in putting this show together because it is a grand show. It really is. It's filmed in Dallas, Texas, where Robert is based. They did some stuff in Germany and Austria, all over the place. It really is a grand show, and it feels that way when you watch it. So we talk about some of those logistical problems as well as just how you can tell this story and and the evolution of history documentaries. It was a really interesting conversation with both of them that I very much enjoyed. So first up, you will hear the conversation with Robert Edsel, who joined me all the way from Dallas, Texas. He is the author of Monuments Men and the chair of the Monuments Men Foundation, and of course, the central part of this series. So I appreciate the time tonight. Glad to be with you and your audience. So I'm, I'm curious, before we get into the specifics of how you find this art and return the art, about where this interest comes from from you because reading your bio your early career was not related to uh, art and uh, returning nazi art so, so for you where does that come from i've really had three careers uh, i had an ambition to be a professional tennis player and had uh, some brief success doing that and then had a completely different trajectory finishing college uh, taking the first job uh, offered to me in the oil and gas exploration business, and I did that and had some success doing that over almost a 20-year career and found myself uh, late 30s wondering uh, what else there was to life. And I wanted to take some time off. You know, the life I feel like can be such a, um, a treadmill. You get going so fast, and, of course, the years are clicking by, and that really is the most precious commodity out there is time. And I moved to Florence and started studying art and architecture. I was reading um, about a book a day because I had the time to do it. And I wondered purely as a curious a curiosity how, during the most destructive war in history, so many works of art survived and who were the people that saved them. And I didn't know the answer. I, I wasn't embarrassed about that, but I was hugely embarrassed that it had never occurred to me to wonder. And I started asking people I'd made friends with who lived in Florence, and they all to the person said, wow, that's a great question. What's the answer? And I said, I don't know. You live here. You should know. And they all looked at me quizzically and said, you know, I've never thought about it. And that was the response I got over the next few years, which led me to dig further. This is right before the Internet became so ubiquitous, and so finding information wasn't as easy as it is today. And that, in turn, led me to these remarkable men and women known as the Monuments Men, museum directors, curators, art historians, um, mostly American, about 30 percent were British, who did something that had never been done before in trying to protect cultural treasures during war 
from the destruction of war and looting by the Nazis. And of course, there was looting by troops as well, displaced persons. They were very desperate times. Anyway, we get to today and we now know at the benefit of hindsight, it was the greatest theft in history. And there's still hundreds of thousands of objects worth billions of dollars missing. And the role of the Monuments Men Foundation um, has been to honor these men and women for their military service and their service to civilization and help complete their mission by raising visibility of the missing things and helping illuminate the path to get them home. And our program, Hunting Nazi Treasure, is, uh, is one component of that. Yeah, and in, in the first episode, it's really interesting to see that a woman approaches the foundation with a tapestry that she has that she wants help to return home. And I'm, I'm curious in, in the work of that foundation, how often does that happen for you where people are approaching you with these artworks that, that you've just talked about versus you having to seek them out? Actually, uh, it's all the former. We don't... We may have leads about uh, about objects, but for the most part, everything we do is on a voluntary basis. We are not a, a catch-you group. We're not a law enforcement group. We are about trying to reach the noble elements of people and help them understand that these objects that they may have perhaps brought home innocently after the war or sent home by some soldier or officer – uh, belong to someone else, and they've enjoyed it for their lifetime, but now it's time to identify who the rightful owner is and get it back home. And so we, we respond. We have uh, calls through our toll-free line and through our website practically every day. We have uh, more than 100 active leads that we work on trying to follow up with information people have provided us. And, of course, we're at a critical juncture now as – the remaining uh, members of the World War II generation, the greatest generation, pass. Their kids in their late 60s, 70s are inheriting whatever's in the attics, basements, and hanging on the walls. A lot of times those things uh, came from Europe during the war and our roles to try and assist people and get them back to where they belong. And how do you do that, though? I mean, you, you mentioned that a lot of the people have died off, and particularly some of the art that was stolen from particularly Jewish people, trying to find the rightful owner of those things could be difficult for a variety of reasons. So uh, what is the methodology through which you try and secure a location for these items? Sometimes it's it's uh, difficult. Sometimes it's, it's easy. Um, it just depends. Uh, several years ago, we returned three paintings to a museum in the town of Dessau in the eastern portion of Germany, what was East Germany, uh, that were taken from a salt mine by um, people, we don't know who took them, but an American officer had them, and he, he was since deceased, but the story that passed down through his family was that he'd won them in a poker game, and he mailed them home. And during those years, Packages from officers were largely treated as diplomatic pouches. No one really looked in these things. So his family had these things and uh, didn't do anything with them. And then when they saw the George Clooney film, The Monuments Men, based on my second book, uh, realized that they needed to do something, and they contacted the foundation. In that case, it was easy. There were museum labels all over the backs of the pictures and also uh, museum descriptions on the front that made it easy for us to identify exactly where they belonged. Usually things aren't that easy. Sometimes they're very, very difficult. We've had instances where in the case of a menorah that was taken, no doubt stolen from a Jewish family by the Nazis that found its way into some repository and was picked up by a soldier and brought home. No one will ever know what synagogue or private uh, house that was taken from. In that instance, we donated it to uh, a Holocaust museum because it was it was something that they could use to bring recognition and visibility to this part of history. So every situation is different. Uh, it involves an enormous amount of research on our part, a lot of experience, and of course, contacts that we have at uh, museums and archives pretty much around the world. And, and how difficult is it to maintain those, given the geographic uh, 
sort of how spread out everything is. I mean, because in the show it talks about, you know, American soldiers could have brought stuff home. Certainly European soldiers would have had stuff and things get passed down or, or potentially even sold from people to people. I mean, these things could be spread all over the world, right? Uh, not could, they are. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I mean, just the breadth of the program, if you think about it, in our eight hours of episodes that uh, viewers will see, we filmed hundreds of hours that they won't see, and we were in 14 countries on four different continents. Uh, it was an extraordinary effort, but that's essentially a, um, a kind of a distilled picture of what we deal with from today to day. Sometimes, of course, these things aren't necessarily limited to World War II. That's our focus, but there are things taken out of Iraq today, out of Afghanistan, issues with ISIS, uh, things that were taken out of uh, the Koreas and Vietnam in the years uh, in the 50s and 60s and 70s that surfaced. So we get all sorts of phone calls, but the, the vast majority focus on the World War II period, and it's a great great feeling when we are able to reunite and connect something that was taken from someone, whether a private collection or museum, and get it back where the general public will be able to see it again. And actually that was leads me into the next question when you talk about that these things still happen where art gets taken in, in conflict zones today. Why is art such a focal point in these conflict zones? I mean, the, the show does a really good job, especially that first episode, going into detail as to why Hitler loved art and why he wanted to build this art collection and, and the methods through which he went about doing it. But why in general, it seems, and, and it's not even just modern history and studying conflicts throughout human history that people have taken artistic items as souvenirs in these conflicts. What is it about art that is so powerful that it continues to be used in this way? It's a good question. Uh, the theft of art and the destruction of culture is part of a playbook, and we ignore it at our own peril. For time memorial, uh, conquerors have stolen cultural treasures of the, uh, of the vanquished, sometimes in, in more ancient times, to pay their soldiers with. That was part of how they, uh, part of the reward. But I think people have always realized the immortality of art if it's not destroyed and the power that it has by uh, by den of recognition by people and their veneration for these objects and that's a very powerful powerful tool that can be used for good or for bad and of course Adolf Hitler in modern times used it in the most pernicious ways recognizing that works of art and cultural treasures define people and civilizations. If you control that, those works of art, um, you, if you destroy them, you destroy really the, the roadmap of how people got to where they got to. And it's why we saw in Bosnia Herzegovina, Herzegovina why we saw uh, ISIS in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Mali, uh, the first thing you see before you get to the capital H Holocaust is the destruction of cultural property and the theft of it. it these things usually don't begin with murdering of people. That is going to happen, but it's like a cat tossing around a snake. They aren't going to kill it right away. They play with it, and they torture it, and they humiliate it, and that is an essential part of what the Nazis did is the humiliation part. We, we know about the, the earth movers uh, and tractors moving uh, piles of emaciated bodies in concentration camps. We've seen these horrific images, perhaps so frequently we've become numb to them. But it didn't begin with that. It began with the, the destruction of synagogues, the destruction of religious objects, the stripping of property ownership rights, the prohibitions of Jews being able to go into museums, the destruction of things that they created uh, being considered degenerate because they were produced by subhumans who couldn't see nature properly. And as a consequence, it's a very, very powerful 
part of the subjugation of people. And so today when we see ISIS go into Mali or go into Afghanistan and destroy the bombing on Buddhas or destroy Islamic objects, how gangster is that? This, this purported Islamic, organi- Islamic belief, these fundamentalists, destroy Islamic objects because they consider they're being worshipped and therefore it's, a, it's a blasphemous in their eyes, so they destroy them. When that happens, no one can profess surprise about what evolves because it's the same thing every time. The, the, the incarceration of people happens, the murdering of people happens, um, the destruction of culture happens, but it always begins the same way. Well, well certainly, in, in listening to you talk, it makes me think about what's going on here in Canada with Indigenous people and the way in which colonialism here has operated in terms of the, the same way of destroying culture. But then it leads me to a question about what the Monuments Men Foundation is doing, and, and to a certain extent, I guess, what the show is doing. And I'm, I'm curious to know if you think that part of what is happening here is an effort towards reconciliation and an effort towards trying to come to terms on a morality sense with what happened in the past. I think our society is grappling with that issue today. In our part of the world, in the United States, and certainly in, in Texas and the South, there's a great deal of focus about the issue of Civil War era Confederate monuments and whether those should be taken down. I mean, there our society is, I think, guilty of um, wanting quick fixes to things, and I suppose it would be nice if the world worked that way, but it never has and it's not going to. Yeah. There are more nuanced answers to these problems. In some cases, uh, in the case of what we're speaking, there aren't, I think, across the board answers that fit every situation. But what we're trying to do clumsily, slowly, but we are making progress, I think, by virtue of talking about it, is to to embody day to day the words which. Thomas Jefferson and George Washington and others, not just in the United States, but in countries, you know, in in democratic oriented free countries around the world have also enunciated. And that is that um, people are created equally. People have rights. And part and parcel of that is a recognition that We have historically not treated people the way that that our Constitution in the United States says we should do that. We fought a civil war not to create the words, but to get people in this country to decide either we're going to abide by them or we're not. And the South lost that war. The Union won the war and President Lincoln's. Um, proclamations of of emancipation and the end of slavery um, kind of codified what the Constitution already said more than 100 years earlier. However, even today, we're clearly, as I know, the Canadians are addressing First Nations issue. We're still trying to find a way to live what we what we embrace in treating people fairly, and that means respecting the things that they value and they treasure culturally. We don't have to like them. We don't even have to understand them, but we have to at least respect that they're important to others and show respect for them. And, and it's really important because, as you mentioned, the, the first step usually in these in these moments of that lead to violence is this cultural destruction. And the the preservation of that is is can be very important and and i'm just curious though with respect to the art itself a lot of my art historian friends would say that art is so much about context and where it is and and when it's made with respect to this art that hitler was collecting how much of the artwork itself is is changed by the fact that it was stolen by the nazis and does that change the the meaning or the way people would interpret those pieces when they're put back into their original place? No, I don't think so. I mean, look, there 
my dad used to say, money doesn't care what pocket it ends up in. <laughs> so, you know, these works of art, that this is why they're constantly stolen and why they are um, destroyed is if we think of works of art like children at a kindergarten, they cannot take care of themselves. Hmm. Everything that we value, everything that we love to go to museums and see or churches or a building, it has it depends on on a civilized society to survive not just not just uh, military conflicts, but in the case of Rome, let's say the war of pollution and carbon monoxide eroding away carbonate um, stone at the case of the Colosseum and other places or um, modern day thefts. It depends on people and their goodwill to want to provide for future generations the opportunities that they've had to enjoy these things during their lifetime. And that's what makes the mo what the monuments men and women did during World War II so exceptional. There have always been wars, but there's never been a war, certainly not the most destructive war in history, a war that claimed 65 million lives, where you had the leadership of the Western allies with President Roosevelt and General Eisenhower, Prime Minister Churchill, clearly enunciate that it was a responsibility to try and uh, mitigate damage to cultural property as much as war would allow. And these monuments officers risked their lives, two were killed in combat, trying to affect that policy. So it's a, it's, a, it's a break with thousands of years of civilization, and it's an important moment for us to be mindful of. Given that, though, are you surprised at how many things were dispersed after the fall of the Nazis, and that people, soldiers, maybe not the monuments men themselves, but certainly soldiers who were in Austria and Germany were so willing to take these items. I think if we if we got together, and I think I, you know, it's hard to find things that a majority of people can agree on in our world today. But I think a majority of people could agree on what I'm going to say. Um, if we found 15 million people, mostly men, and pick a number, 10,000 of them just went out of their way to steal. That's a pretty good percentage. That's like 98%. Right. If it's 100,000 people, that'd be a lot of looters. It's still a pretty good percent. So we focus as a society on the bad things that happen each day because it's newsworthy, it sells, it's what the public's interested in. But we all know that there's far more good stories out there. It's just that they don't grab our attention in the same way. And likewise, during World War II, the fact that the monuments officers, I can document, found and returned more than five million stolen objects. Five million stolen objects. It's a mind-boggling number and a mind-boggling achievement in a period of no technology and very little transportation. Um, that's pretty extraordinary. And the fact that you may have had I don't think it was 100,000 soldiers. I don't even think it was 10,000. But the fact that you may have had some bad apples who deliberately took things or some that, uh, in most cases, took them as souvenirs, I don't find that surprising at all. So I think our focus really shouldn't be on what soldiers were doing that they shouldn't have been doing. I think the nobility of what got done that was a good thing is really the more surprising moment. But it's not as interesting as talking about things that were taken. Right. So for you, this is very much a heroic story of what happened with these soldiers. Uh, you know, I, I have uh, vigorous discussions with some of my European friends about our our affection in the West, Canada included, for the use of the word hero. Yes. Uh, we throw it around a lot. But, you know, the definition of a hero is someone who conducts themselves in a manner that is uh, something that is a, serves as a role model for how we would want to live our lives or raise our children. Mm -hmm. That's the simplest definition of hero. Certainly, the two monuments officers that were killed in combat trying to protect cultural treasures, I don't think anybody would present an argument that they weren't heroic. Uh, and when you have, uh, during, the, during the wartime period, not after the war, during the wartime period, about 40 monuments officers max in Italy and 50 or so in Northern Europe responsible for covering 
an entire continent and also some monuments officers in Southeast Asia and things like that who were for the most part uh, middle-aged, had families, professional careers, and weren't at risk of being drafted, and yet they walked away from having life made to risk their lives to go do this. I think that's pretty heroic behavior, and I think most people think it is too. And so there's that aspect to it, but there's certainly uh, some horrible people that, you know, we haven't come across any horrible monuments officers, but there have been some horrible people out there that looted and knew exactly what they were doing. And, of course, then you have a more complicated factor. I sometimes refer to it as the good, the bad, and the ugly. The goods are the Western allies, the bads, the Nazis, and the uglies, the Soviet Union part, because there was an enormous amount of looting by Soviet Red Army soldiers who had, in many cases, very little to go home to because their country was so gutted by the Nazis. Uh, we, we talk in the United States, and, and I know in Canada, about our enormous losses during World War II. In the United States, 405,000 people killed during World War II, a war that was fought on, on soil other than ours, but for the territory of Pearl Harbor and, and Hawaii. The Soviet Union lost 25 million people, 17 and a half million civilians that didn't ask for a war, and seven and a half million soldiers. So that number is staggering, 25 million people. It's the size of Mexico City or Tokyo today. And I'm not making justification for the deliberate removal of cultural items out of Germany and Austria by the Soviets, but we must ask ourselves if there had been 25 million Americans killed, would we have been as noble? And I hope that we would have. I hope that we would be. But, and I hope that we never find out the answer to that. But it's easy to, easy to criticize in very difficult circumstances uh, during World War II. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. And we look forward to seeing how these stories play out in the series Hunting Nazi Treasure, premiering on October the 24th at 10 p.m. And we are thrilled to have had Robert M. Edsel from Dallas. Thanks so much for the time tonight. Thank you very much, Sean. We appreciate it. All right, and joining us now from Toronto, Ontario, Steve Gamester, the series producer of the Hunting Nazi Treasure show. Steve, welcome to the show. Hi, Sean. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the time tonight, and we just talked with Robert, and, and as you and I were just talking before we started to record, obviously very passionate guy and, and very invested in this project. So he has the Monuments Men book. He has the foundation. He's been doing this work. How did you get involved with this project? I got involved in this specific story in the summer of 2015. Um, there was a story that made quite a few newspapers about how there were these guys in southern Poland who claimed they had discovered a train that was possibly... Um, loaded with Nazi loot, Nazi gold, that was hidden in a tunnel in southern Poland. And um, the story really struck me, uh, first of all, that there could be a train buried underground in Poland that hadn't been seen since the Second World War, but also that there were people today, um, who seems like, you know, ordinary guys, who were still searching for treasure that was lost during the Second World War. I thought it was very interesting, and I thought the fact that it was receiving so much coverage um, certainly said something. And I knew a little bit about the subject already. I'd seen the Monuments Men, the film, um, you know, through the course of my studies as a student, you know, I studied the Second World War, had been involved in various documentary projects for History Channel related to the Second World War. So I knew that the Nazis had stolen a lot of art. Um, you know, it appears in Hollywood films every once in a while. Um, you pick it up here and there. But I didn't know the full extent of it, but it struck me as an interesting way, different way into the history of the Second World War, where you could um, look at the battle over culture, where you could really drill into some of the habits, behaviors, and actions of, of top Nazis not just Hitler, but some of his deputies who um, were known to loot art. I wanted to know why they did it, how they did it, and where some of this stuff might be today. So you're obviously coming at this from a very different perspective than Robert, 
because he's invested in this. He's written about this. And you're coming in more of a, so this is this really interesting thing as an outsider. In in meeting with Robert and coming up with how this show is going to work, how do you find the balance between his very insider knowledge and knowing exactly what's going on here versus your outsider, hey, this is kind of fun and I think it would make a good TV show. Where, where is that or how does that meeting go in in trying to set up a parameters for a TV show? Yeah, really good question, because that creative collaboration between myself and Robert and then by extension, uh, the directors and people at his foundation was really the, you know, the basis of everything. It needed to work. I mean, there are a couple of things there. One, I think any time you're approaching um, historical subject matter um, and you're presenting it to a wide audience, you do have a responsibility to treat that material with respect. Um, you need to get things right. Uh, you need to put things in the proper context, um, especially when it comes to, um, you know, the, the crimes of the Nazi state. I mean, you know, the comparisons to the Nazis are thrown around quite a lot in our culture today, and I think it's important to treat that history accurately and, and with respect. So when you begin to look around at who are people who can speak about this subject in, um, with authority, um, but also who can reach a general audience, because that's the other side of this. You know, you, we are making a documentary series for a um, commercial television channel and for a wide audience. So you need someone who can connect to people who might not know who Hermann Goering is, who might not know the Second World War um, encyclopedia in an encyclopedic way. So, you know, Robert was someone who immediately was at the top of the list. Um, you know, like I said, I'd already read his book, The Monuments Men. I then proceeded to read some of his other books. He's, he's written another fantastic book about, um, about uh, uh, what happened to art in Italy and during the Second World. Not just art, but it's culture in general, architecture, all kinds of things. So I gave him a call, you know, I, I, he had a foundation, he has a foundation, I should say, um, that uh, the Monuments Men Foundation that sort of looks to carry on the legacy of the Monuments Men and trying to find uh, missing works of art and other cultural objects still missing. So I just gave him a call and I told him why I was interested in the subject and that I thought, you know, we could put together a really interesting documentary series about it and that he would be the perfect collaborator to do it. And then you also call a bunch of other people too, right? And uh, you ask them who they think would be good. And people kept saying, well, you really got to talk to Robert Edsel. Um, he's the guy who can uh, really help bring this, this history to life. So that's, that's how it began. And with respect to the, the uh, that origin story is always really interesting on these collaborative projects because then you have historians and uh, other historians on the show and you have an investigative reporter and and that team it seems like an eclectic group if i may say just from seeing yeah. the show i mean that you know just listen to the accents of the different people who are there so you have a, a, an eclectic group but all people who are very knowledgeable with respect to the war and it seems to me people who are coming in with a background in this area with the with respect to the Nazis and, and their stealing of art. And, and again, it, it's one of those things, too, though, that the show is being created for the History Channel, right? which I have to imagine is different from creating a show for, say, the CBC, where your audience is maybe more inclined towards history and therefore you can go with historians and create a, a show that has more experts on it or, or am i just projecting too much on that no no i think that's fair well um for the first part of your question about the sort of uh, mix of the team um and well it actually feeds into the second part of your question History Channel was interested in the subject, in the subject of the looting of art and cultural treasures and gold during the Second World War. But they didn't want um, what they might call a uh, stock and talk approach. Now, stock and talk, which, you know, there's nothing wrong with. In fact, some of my favorite documentaries are stock and talk. But basically, that's archival footage mixed with um, interviews, mixed with the narrator. That's sort of the right. traditional way to tell a historical story. 
Um, not very fashionable these days. I mean, you know, there are hundreds of channels out there. Um, there are thousands of different ways that you can get um, content online um, and, you know, discuss uh, or, or get historical content. So, you know, History was interest, History Channel was very interested in us taking a um, active investigative approach. You know, they were intrigued by the idea that 70 years, more than 70 years since the end of the Second World War, there could still be objects, you know, some art objects worth over $100 million that were still missing. So, you know, they were interested in the idea of us putting together a team of investigators, people with different skills, people who could bring different things to the table, and essentially, the program, the treatment of the program would be to follow in their footsteps, to be a fly on the wall following these investigators as they scoured the globe um, investigating this mystery. Because essentially what it is, it's a, it's a you know, seven-year-old cold case, uh, a lot of these missing items. So, you know, Robert was the first person that we talked to. Um, and, that, you know, I'm very happy that we, you know, connected and he was interested in doing this as well. And he was involved also in, in history was involved. He was involved. Lots of people were involved in, okay, well, who else is going to be part of this team? It made sense to have someone who was a historian of the Second World War in a wider context. Um, and again, it needed to be someone who could be entertaining, who understood how to reach a wide audience. So that's James Holland. He's sort of our World War II historian. And in fact, James is in the middle of a three-volume study on the history of uh, the Western Front. And he's written, I think at last count, something like a dozen books on the Second World War. He's quite a popular television presenter um, in the UK um, in particular, but has also appeared in quite a few documentaries in Canada and the States as well. So, you know, the idea was that James could give sort of context, put this story in the context of the water war to tell us who some of these top Nazi guys were. Um, and I knew that he could have that investigative approach. Um, our third investigator is Connor Woodman, who, um, you know, is, is a great presenter. He'd been in a series that I had seen um, Oh, of course, the name escapes me at the moment, Connor. If you're listening, I apologize. <laughs> um, uh, what was it called? Scam City for National Geographic Channel, where Connor would sort of investigate the criminal underworld of different cities around the world. And I knew that he'd also had a background in um, in, in in finance um, and sort of tracking down illegal money. So we thought it would be interesting to have someone with that expertise, more of an investigative journalist who wasn't an expert on the Second World War. I thought that was an interesting. You know, Connor knows, of course, you know, the basics. Um, well, he knows more than the basics, actually. But, you know, you can't have Robert Edsel or James Holland ask questions on camera about the Second World War that the audience would expect that they would know. Right. But Connor, because he comes, from, comes at the subject as a little bit of an outsider, he could. So the idea is that Connor was always supposed to represent the natural curiosity of the viewer, you know, that he would ask the questions the viewer would possibly um, be wondering. And then there was the added advantage that Connor's just kind of up for everything. You know, he's, he's a certified diver. There's one scene in um, episode uh, two of the series called Goering's Greed about Hermann Goering, you know, Hitler's deputy, has the Luftwaffe, and perhaps the most notorious looter of the 20th century. You know, we, we actually... Um, found the remains of, of Durings former country estate in uh, northeast Germany. It's this um, place known as Karen Hall, which was this grand kind of hunting lodge where Goering kept so much looted art that he have to, had to start hanging it from the ceiling. So at the end of the war, you know, he orders his, his, build, his, his hunting lodge, his beloved hunting lodge, blown up because he doesn't want it to fall into the hands of the Red Army. And, um, but the bunker that was underneath the house survived. But to get in there, there was this narrow space about six inches wide. And, you know, I looked at Connor and Connor looked at me and the kind of crew were all looking at each other thinking there's no chance in hell I'm crawling in there. <laughs> but Connor just got on with it. He grabbed the camera, grabbed the flashlight, crawled in and started, 
you know, snooping around Herman Goering's wartime bunker, and it's great television, and it does link to this water story. So that eclectic mix of, you know, Robert, who had this strong background in the investigation of the story, who'd also been involved in the return of objects, mixed with James, the general World War II historian, mixed with Connor, the investigative journalist, action man, was the core. But then we also had a lot of other people around them. Um, Dorothy Schneider, um, who's a German art restitution expert, is a big part of the series, and she's fantastic. Um, you know, really someone who understands that world of missing art, um, the value of missing art, and where some of these objects might be. So it was an ensemble cast. Mm-hmm. Um, for this investigation. Yeah, and I mean, you say it's great television. It is great television. Also kind of terrifying <laughs> to think that he, like when he goes to crawl in there, it is, I mean, I, I just thought to myself, I, I, obviously, you know, he's not going to die, but you're like, you could see a man just get crushed to death. <laughs> when this, that, like that was, uh, I mean, good for him for doing it, but I was, I was nervous for him knowing that this was shot like a year ago or, or however long ago it would have been shot. Yeah. Well, there was that thought. And I think I actually said to the director, what if we can't get him out? You know, you can almost <laughs> imagine the headline, you know, you know, a history channel show, you know, presenter <laughs> trapped in Goering's bunker, you know, hey, you know, all publicity is good publicity. Maybe yeah, that's right. But, uh, but um, yeah, actually, that's not true. But, uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, it, you know, it's, it's, that's part of that. You know, you never want history to feel um, like it completely exists in the past. So I think, you know, one of the great things about history is that it's such a wonderful tool to understanding the world today. Right. And, you know, whether that be um, sort of investigating and going to the places where things happened or um, sort of interviewing someone who was there or finding an object that links you to that past, those are really effective ways to demonstrate history's relevance today. Um, so that was part of our approach. We, didn't, we weren't just going to do stock and talk. We were going to go to Goering's country estate. We were going to go to the Catherine Palace in Russia, where the Amber Room disappeared. We were going to go to the Hermitage Museum in Russia, um, you know, which was a major target of the Nazis, but they never quite made it there. Um, We were going to go to the salt mine in Austria, where Hitler kept billions of dollars worth of looted art and was discovered by American soldiers at the end of the war. It was important, you know, to give that sense of the scale and the scope of the greatest theft in history committed by the Nazis to go to these places. Um, that's, that's how we wanted to, to bring the history alive. And, and I think you capture that because you do see just how vast it was. The salt mine stuff is remarkable to see, and as is the eagle's nest uh, as well. That's another one that, that I really enjoyed in watching, watching the show. But it leads to the question of how you were able to pull this off because – in in so many cases, the finances of these things, I, I, I you know, obviously don't want to get into the specifics of, of how much was spent and all that, but in terms of putting it all together, this is not a small scale project. So, you know, especially in a Canadian context, we're not used to seeing as an audience large scale production value. So, so how did that process work out in terms of convincing people to fund this project, given the mass scale that you just talked about? Yeah, it's a good question. I'm not sure how we pulled it off either. Um, I mean, you know, the financing I'm, I'm, I'm happy to talk about. But first, well, not specifically, but I can give you the broad strokes. But, um, you know, in terms of the production values and traveling around, I mean, you know, it's it's part of what makes it epic. You know, you're, you're talking about the biggest war in history, the greatest theft in history. Um, We filmed in 13 different countries on four continents. That had to be the way to tell this story. I don't think you would have been doing it justice if you didn't. You know, really early on, I flew down to Dallas to meet with Robert, and we had this empty, intimidating whiteboard and another empty, intimidating corkboard. And we were each sort of, and, and, and you know, um, uh, Nick Godwin, who's the producer out of the UK, and I, I do have to acknowledge that this is a UK-Canada co-production, so we're both involved. 
um, it, it, it'll broadcast on Channel 4 in the UK. Um, so, you know, this is not an entirely Canadian production, but it is a majority Canadian production. It is something to be um, proud of. Um, but, you know, we all sat down in that office and we kind of wrote down, you know, what are, what are the important tenets of this series? And one that we all immediately agreed to is it needs to feel epic. You know, um, we needed to go to these places. In terms of how you do that, you just you have a really good team. Like anything else, you have to have really strong local fixers. You know, um, people who in each of these countries who not only speak the language but can help you get access to places. And you need time. You know, I, I think that's that's one thing I commend um, all of the partners involved in this project. They gave us the time to make this show. I mean, we do live in a world where you know, turnaround time for um, books or online properties is so fast, especially news. I mean, you see it in the news more than anything else, right? We have this crazy breakneck pace news cycle. Um, and, you know, I mean, that's another show, but uh, the, the <laughs> cultural consequences of that, where you just dive into things, you don't have time to really figure out the story and let it evolve. Um, we did have the time. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons we were able to do this, and that's because our broadcasters, History Channel and Channel 4, recognized that this was something they needed to give us time to do. I mean, you can't make one phone call and get into the Hermitage Museum in Russia or, you know, the Bodo Museum in Berlin or, you know, figure out how you're going to get into Hermann Goering's underground bunker. These things take time. Um, and we had about a year to produce this show. In terms of the finances, I mean, you know, it gets, seems like it gets harder and harder every year. You know, you tend to spend about a year raising the money and then about a year making the show. Mm. I much prefer the time, the year making the show. <laughs> but that was kind of the case here. But it is a big investment, you know. These channels are putting up a lot of money, and, and I mean, a lot of money, well, you know, it, 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 to, to make this thing, and you know, they they want to be sure that they're going to get back something quality for their investment. But I am one of the things I am really proud of is that Canada did take the lead on this. Right. You know, Canada is always sort of punched above its weight when it comes to documentary films. You know, it goes back to the great tradition of the NFB and the CBC and that sort of um, you know culture of, of of building that as a genre that Canadians could um, dive into. And I also think that there's something about, especially on a, the Second World War, you know, it was interesting working with Americans and, 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 and Brits on this. You know, I mean, I felt like I played that typical Canadian role of sort of really understanding as an observer, you know, British culture and American culture and how <laughs> the show could, could succeed. Um, so, you know, it was a majority Canadian team, but with very, very strong partners in the U.K., um, and of course, you know, Robert's whole team in, in the States, uh, it was an international effort, um, to put this thing as it should have been because it's an international story. Right. And it's not a Canadian specific story. And, and I mean, certainly Robert's organization is in Dallas. Um, a lot of the art is European, obviously, and, and certainly the on-site stuff would have had to have been shot in Europe. So it, it makes sense that it'd be that collaborative of an effort. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. It was, um, it's an international story. And, you know, one of the themes that Robert pointed out early on, and he's right about this, is that, you know, these, when the Nazis decided to do this, and it, I mean, it wasn't a single decision, although it was quite coordinated as the war progressed, um, to sort of loot the world's cultural treasures, um, mostly Europe's treasures, um, and to decide what was acceptable art and what wasn't acceptable art. Um, you know, that's, that's a threat to all of us. This is the world's collective heritage, these great works of art. Um, and some of them were destroyed, and some of them were lost during the Second World War, and that's a loss for all of us. You know, I mean, the, I, I keep bringing it up, but it was an episode that, really left an impression on me. We, in the final episode of the series, um, or sorry, the second to last episode, um, we traveled to Russia. And Robert interviews um, the head of the Hermitage Museum, uh, Dr. Piotrowski, 
who's sort of a legend in Russia. He's been the director of the museum since 1990. And Piotrowski says quite eloquently, so I'm not going to get it exactly right, but I'm paraphrasing, that art belongs to all of us. It doesn't matter if a Van Gogh is displayed in Russia or Holland or France or South America, as long as it's displayed and as long as the public has access to it. And I think that's one of the tenets of this series, this belief that art and culture is something that makes us human and that we all have a collective responsibility to protect it because it tells us who we are. And that responsibility continues to this day. You only have to look at um, the destruction of cultural treasures and sites in Syria um, because of the war in Syria to realize that this is a constant threat to humanity, to, to the destruction of our cultural heritage, and we want to protect it. And this story represents an effort um, to do that. And that's that's a good thing. Yeah. Within that, though, because of how personal it can be or how filled with these larger cultural ramifications, was there anybody who was hesitant to participate in, in terms oh, of getting sure. access? Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course, lots of people. But that always happens, you know. I mean, right. Well, you know, <laughs> you know, I said that we had enough time, but we actually we really didn't. I mean, you know, these store the art market, is a notoriously um, opaque. <laughs> <laughs> that seems like a nice uh, way to say that. Business. Yeah. Well, it is. I mean, you know, just it's, the it's value. Sh- it, it seems shady uh, to me. Let's. I mean, well, aspects of it are. I mean, yeah. you know, the shady people give the legitimate people a bad name. There right. were lots of um, big names in the art community who helped us. Okay. Didn't necessarily go on camera, but helped us. A mm-hmm. lot of them, um, because they knew Robert and, and thought, you know, what Robert had done was important and that this was an extension of that. So there were lots of people um, who did help us. Um, they might not have wanted to go on camera, but they did help us. But, you know, the people who know where a lot of the art taken by the Nazis is still hidden today a lot of them don't want exposure, right? They, right? they might, you know, those people might be holding on to works of art that they know were looted by the Nazis, mm-hmm. but they're worth so much money mm-hmm. that they don't want to give them up. They're just sitting on them, hoping, hoping that one day or some way they might be able to unload them, or maybe they just want to keep them because these are beautiful works of art. So, you know, we did make quite a concerted effort to contact people in the art community who are known to be, as you say, on the more shady side of that mm-hmm. community. Um, and, you know, didn't have much success in getting them to talk. Right. Um, so it's, it's uh, they know who they are. If they're listening. <laughs> <laughs> well, but that's in. the thing that's, that's really surprising, too, is that in the show, when you talk about people still have this and they're hesitant, especially around the area around the salt mine in the first episode or two, whenever it is, where they go through and they're like, you know, there could be stuff in people's on people's walls here or in, in basements or whatever that we were taken from that collection. But there's laws in Austria that prevent you from selling that stuff. And certainly I, I can't imagine a situation in which a high profile piece that is known to have been from the, that Nazi collection could get stolen and, even if you could, there, it's surely to goodness there has to be some level of morality or ethics involved in not wanting to profit off Nazi theft of art. Like it, 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 that's the element of it that is surprising to me is that not only is there this this push towards getting the art back where it is, but that there is a hesitancy on the part of those who might have it. I, I could see it if your parents or grandparents were were members of the party or 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 even if they were soldiers who american soldiers who had taken it back and it could reflect poorly on them and i get the personal element of that but on a larger scale it seems like the the push of what robert's doing with the show at its core i think is doing is uh, an effort towards trying to write something it is and i think you know it people's motives are they're varied right and it, and and it's not always clear what those 
motives are. I think, you know, as much as we ran into some brick walls and were quite frustrated by some people not talking to us, um, there were also lots of cases of people doing the right thing. Um, you know, when people, and, and you know, the, the first episode that broadcasts, which, you know, you've referenced, which focuses on Hitler, um, you know, there's a, a great sequence in that one about an American family that discovers that they have something that uh, Hitler acquired in the Second World War. And I use that word acquired deliberately. It wasn't exactly looted, but, you know, under the circumstances it, it was. Anyways, you'll have to watch the episode <laughs> to figure out cryptically what I'm saying. <laughs> but, you know, that family, that American family that ended up with this thing, they did the right thing. They, they realized it should go back. Um, there are other families that have done the right thing, other individuals. Um, you know, sometimes it's just not even knowing what you're supposed to do. I mean, if you suddenly discovered um, that your grandfather or your grandmother, you, you inherited some painting, and you found out, you know, first of all, it'd be hard to even necessarily, you, you might not even know that this thing was looted by the Nazis and taken yeah. from a family in Europe. But even if you did, well, what do you do next? Right. You know, you could be terrified that, oh, my goodness, my family's been in possession of stolen property for seven years. Am I going to get arrested? Am I going to be in trouble? So I think, you know, that's one of the things that um, the Monuments Foundation, Roberts Foundation, tries to do is, you know, they want to be an information source. If you suspect that you have something that may have disappeared during the Second World War, you can call them. And ask them what the laws are in the in wherever you're. If you're in the states, if you're in Europe, because the laws are different everywhere. And you know, our position and Robert's position is that you know, we want the art to come back to to be open to the public to get back to its rightful owners. Um, we're not law enforcement, um, right. so you know, we give advice or he gives advice. Not not the show, but but Robert and the foundation. So, you know, I mean, there, there are avenues for people to do the right thing. And I think, you know, because we are seeing that generation, the generation of the Second World War, um, pass on, you know, there are people all over the world who are inheriting things. And some of those things are cultural property that were looted during the war. So I think, you know, it's, we're going to be hearing about this stuff for years, maybe even decades to come. And the show is the, the start of it. And, well, it's not the start, but I, I right. hope it's a continuation. You know, it's, it has been a you know, story that um, has come up from time to time and, you know, like many things, waxed and waned in the public's consciousness. And I hope, you know, in, a, in whatever way our show can help bring it to the forefront. I mean, you know, the, the big dream for this show would be that something um, after the show airs comes to light. I think if that happens, you know, it'll be a real feather in our cap because, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to find this stuff. <laughs> right, yeah. Very hard. Yeah. And, and yeah, hopefully it, it, it inspires somebody to look into what they have, or maybe someone who knows that they have something. And, and now, as you say, maybe they just don't know what to do with it. And here is information to, to say, Hey, call up Robert and, and his organization and, and try and work out where this thing should go. So hopefully it exactly. leads to some, some positive things. So, again, we I encourage so. everyone to, to watch the show premiering October the 24th. It's Hunty Nazi Treasure, and that is series producer Steve Gamester. Thanks for the time tonight, Steve. Thanks, Sean. Appreciate it. So there you have it, my conversations with both Robert Edsel and Steve Gamester, and I appreciate both of them for taking the time to talk to me. And, and in the show, you might have noticed that I said, thanks for your time tonight. And that's because we recorded these episodes a little after hours from what we would normally do. So I appreciate both of them staying up a little later than, uh, than perhaps normal in order to record the shows because I wanted to talk to them about the program because I've had the chance to see the first three episodes very much enjoyed all three of them. And as Steve and I talked about, there is very much a storytelling element to the show where at the start of the show, they present a problem or a question that they're investigating through that episode. And in addition to that, which keeps your interest through the show, it also is very real to life for those of us who have done historical research. 
where you go down one road and there's nothing there or you go down another one and it's it's maybe a wrong answer or completely different from what you would expect to find. So that element of the show is what I really liked about it or part of what I really liked about it because it was true to the historical experience and the, the process through which you conduct your research. So in addition to being a really good storytelling device, there's also a relatability for anyone who's ever done historical research. And even if you haven't, certainly when you're doing any sort of project work or or whatever it is, there's always these steps along the way where things change in the midst, right? You don't never end up with the final product that you expect to end up with at the start. And the show allows you to experience that with the people who are doing that research with the monuments men organization. And you get to see that process through and it's, it's very true to life where there's an element of realism to it that I very much appreciate it in addition to the effective storytelling. So I I really do recommend the show. And again, it debuts on Tuesday, October the 24th at 10 East and Pacific on the History Channel. So set your DVRs, even better if you watch it at the time. So set your DVRs for the whole series. And, you know, from the shows that I've seen, it's not one of these shows that starts out really hot and it's a great first episode, and then it really falls down after that. It, it certainly maintains and keeps your interest throughout the, the series. So, again, Tuesday, October 24th, 10 p.m., the, the program, Hunting Nazi Treasure, debuts. So be sure to check it out. And then just one more thing before we go, I want to mention that for those of you who have been longtime iTunes subscribers, I'm very grateful that you have been with us for so long. I just want to let everybody know, though, that we have a new iTunes feed. The old feed died in the spring. It stopped updating. It has since been fixed, but we could not repair it in the way that we wanted to. So we just created an entirely new iTunes feed. So if you search History Slam in iTunes or Apple Podcast, if you would like, there's a new feed there. It has all of the episodes we've ever done. The old feed only had the most recent 10, so the new feed has all now 106 shows and it'll continue to update and it'll have the entire catalog of all the shows. So if you wanna go and find that. Similarly, we are also on Google Play and Stitcher and TuneIn and any of the podcast apps, podcasters that you use, we can be found there. So please feel free to subscribe to us wherever is the most convenient. And don't forget the Active History YouTube channel, which uh, is up there on YouTube. We've recently put together some new playlists and we've reorganized the channel. So it's a little clearer to see what's new, what's there, and, and what is available to you. So if you haven't yet, go subscribe to that and you can find not only all these episodes, but some other talks that we've done and some great video content that we have up there as well from a couple of conferences. We have a couple of videos that have been sort of short movies that have been put together. So, so there's content up there. So do check out the Active History YouTube channel as well. And as always, if you have any questions or comments for the podcast, history slam at gmail.com, Twitter at Dr. Shawnee Fever. And if you're out and you see Enrico Palazzo, please say hi for me. Thanks for listening to the History Slam podcast. Be sure to check out Active History for more features, articles, and be sure to subscribe on iTunes.